if you don't like Drake, this sort of function-oriented paradigm where you do most of your setup to begin with and test those individual functions and modularly before you put them into the top the the, the um, top level part of the part of the workflow and to have that top level function or script to be very small. I think it's a useful strategy for for large projects from dissertations to to actionable industry data analysis workflows. But for Drake specifically, it's there's not that much extra work to do to take this and to put it into Drake. And there is a lot of payoff if you do that. And I'm gonna walk through that. So the, the final step for taking something like this and putting it into Drake is to define something called a plan. And usually I'll have this plan.r script to, to define that. So what is a plan? A plan is just an outline of the steps of your workflow. We outline our workflow in steps so we can skip them later. So Drake saves time by skipping computations that it doesn't need to run. And I'll walk through how that works, but in order to do that, we have to define what those steps actually are so we can skip them. So we have a step to read in our data, we have a step to pre-process it, and that's all we're gonna start with now because we're gonna start small here. And so that's the code that we write to define our plan. Our actual plan is just a data frame. It's a data frame of the steps that we're gonna do. So by creating the plan, we didn't actually run anything just yet. This is still set up. And this setup is, is absolutely worthwhile. What we have here is a bunch of R commands. So these are just arbitrary, arbitrary pieces of code. And what is going to happen is these are gonna run and the, the data objects are going to be labeled with these informative names that we defined previously. And each of, these, each of these steps is called a target and the target names here are on the left. When we actually, when we, when we go to run these setup, these setup steps, Drake can actually analyze your workflow and tell you what's going on. So if we load our packages, functions, and plan, you can write in this visDrake graph function to, to ask Drake to tell us what are the moving parts in our workflow and how does it all fit together? And so we've defined this churn data and churn recipe as, as targets and churn data comes before and churn recipe. It needs to be run before, the data needs to be run before the recipe is run. And the data depends on this data file and this split data function, this churn recipe, I know the arrows are overlapping, but it depends on this prepare recipe function here. Now Drake automatically notices this because it, it looks at this plan and it runs something called static code analysis on these commands. So it analyzes the symbols in these commands without actually running the code. And it uses this to understand the code before it actually runs it. So it notices that in this churn recipe command, there's the symbol churn data. And so it knows that the churn data target is a dependency of churn recipe, which is why in the graph it puts that, it draws an arrow from churn data to churn, to churn recipe. And likewise with this prepare recipe function. So you can, you can actually define the targets in this plan in any order you want. And it doesn't matter to Drake. It's, it allows you to think about the, the individual targets, the individual components of your research. And then Drake takes it and fits it all together automatically, it under, leave it to, to Drake to understand how, how your entire workflow should proceed. And so when you actually go to run the project with the make function, what Drake is gonna do is it's gonna run the correct targets in the correct order, so data before the recipe. It's going to, and it's going to store those values in a cache on, on disk for, for later use. And because those targets are stored on disk, you can restart your session and still, and still your work is still going to be saved. And you can, you can read those, and you can get those data objects back. So the, the read and load functions are the ways to, to get targets back from, from this cache. And so what it's really doing is reading these data files. But notice, you're, you don't need to worry about file names at all. All you need is the target name. 
And so what, one of the great things that Drake does is it abstracts the files as targets and it, it makes it so that you don't have to worry about micromanaging files. You don't need to decide where these data files go or what they should be called. It, Drake, Drake's abstraction takes care of that for you. And it's extremely helpful for organizing projects. At this point, we've, we have defined our targets, our initial targets formally in, in a plan, and we've, we've run them. We've done a little exploratory data analysis. This is our exploratory data analysis phase of the project with load and read. And after that, after we've decided, okay, our current set of targets is pretty good. We're going to add, add a couple more targets. We're going to build up this plan incrementally, and then we're going to repeat uh, we're going to repeat this process. We're going to repeat the workflow with the make function, but we're not actually repeating yourself. You know, people, people talk about dry workflows, DRY standing for don't repeat yourself. When you call the make function repeatedly, you're not actually repeating all of your work necessarily. So you can afford to do it pretty often and pretty frequently. And that's, that's what um, allows you to build up this plan gradually and think about the pieces. So we're just going to add some, deep neural nets, some, some models, using different hyperparameters, and we're going to use the functions that we've defined. And we're gonna see that everything prior is up to date because we didn't change the underlying code or data yet. And the outdated pieces are the models. And it's good practice to always look at the graph at times like this, and we look at the graph, we see that, okay, our models are properly connected to our functions and our data, our previous targets. The data targets are up to date, the model targets need to rerun. And so that's exactly what the make function does, and it skips everything else. And we can likewise read and inspect our targets. Instead of saving the actual model objects, we saved one row data frames to sort of, to, to make this, this whole process as tidy and light and storage as possible. We stored one row data frames with the accuracy and the model hyperparameters that we expect to tune. And we can go forward and add more targets. So we're gonna, we're gonna go through our previous model runs, pick the one with the best accuracy and retrain that model, return it as an object so maybe we can more easily deploy it to production or a company or we can, we can, we can run it through further tests, through further prediction tasks. And again, it skips the previous work because all our previous targets are up to date. We can inspect our model. So because we said format equal to keras in this optional target function, Drake knows to store this as a keras model, which isn't always, isn't always possible. It needs to be serialized in a special way, but that's possible within Drake specifically. That's a feature. And likewise, we can go forward when we add some more models, something interesting begins to happen. So not only is the new model that we added out of date, so this new model, this one softmax, our downstream targets are also invalidated. So if we look at the graph, previously we ran best run and best model, but because we have this new model introduced, those targets are no longer valid. And they need to run to reflect the latest results from all the models. Drake automatically detects this. And so it not only runs the, the model, it runs, it, it picks the best model run all over again. And if that best run turns out to be the same model, if this target's return value is the same, it doesn't bother to retrain that best model again. This may or may not happen depending on the results of the model, but Drake can make that decision based on the content of the data itself instead of something else like timestamps. If you change a function, likewise, Drake notices the change and reacts to it. So if we change the dropout rate of this layer, we go to the graph, we see that, okay, the function that we changed is define model, which, which affects train model, which affects test model. And so all of these targets downstream are still, are, are invalidated because they need to run again to reflect the, the latest model definition. So Drake automatically knows and understands how these functions can be nested because of that static code analysis. And so when we run the make function, all the models and the necessary downstream results rerun. 
But suppose that was a sort of a temporary experiment and you want to go back to your previous work. And you go back to this function, you change the dropout rate back to 0.1. Well, if you, if you want to revert your work without wasting a whole lot of time, you can set recovery equal to true in the make function. And as long as these targets were built with the same versions of the dependencies and the command and the random number generator seed and other, other dependencies, Drake will automatically recover these targets without actually rerunning everything. And this has saved a whole lot of time. You know, I've been, I've been under time pressure sometimes at work to answer really quick one-off questions that just required quick changes to the code. I, I go in and I, I change a function, I answer that question, and I revert back to the main, the main thread of the project. This has, been, this has been helpful to explore tangents quickly without getting into a whole lot of trouble. And if a data file changes because of this file in keyword that we use in one of the commands, Drake can also notice changes in data files and automatically react. But at the end of the day, if you haven't changed anything, Drake will just check your work, tell you that all your targets are up to date and do nothing else. And this is super important for reproducibility. It's tangible evidence that your results match the code and data they came from. It's, it's evidence that the results are synchronized with what you're sharing with your collaborators in terms of the, of the code and data, and it increases our ability to trust the conclusions of the project. And in this approach to pipeline tools where, in this approach to workflow management, where we're running parts of the project and updating parts of the project instead of the entire thing, this is extremely helpful. Drake also tracks history of, of past model runs with the Drake history function. And so you can see past versions of targets that you've created along with the, some of the named function arguments in the function calls and those commands. And you can recover old data, if you like, without, without doing the whole data recovery thing if you don't want to. As long as you didn't garbage collect the cache, this is possible. So there are, there are a bunch more features that Drake supports, like high performance computing on clusters. That's another whole huge topic that, that my, collaborator, my collaborators and I use quite frequently. It's super useful, but it's not that much of a, of a stretch. So it's, it's not something I usually go over in workshops like this. Um, but the materials and documentation, there's a whole chapter in the manual, in the online, in the online manual that talks about this. Um, down here. And it goes over different kinds of high performance computing options, different algorithms and options, and things that you can take away and apply right away. There are efficient data formats like the, the Keras model format, and there's, there are formats to support storage and data tables, etc., and a bunch more topics that you can get into. Um, Drake is on CRAN. You can download it in examples. And this workshop is open source on this GitHub page, available for, for download and exploration if you, if you want to run it locally. And here are a bunch more links to resources. The slides themselves with this link are at this URL up top, also linked from the Learn Drake short course, which you're in right now. Um, if you have a use case that you're particularly excited about or willing to share, our open size is collecting use cases of its packages, and so they would, they would love to hear from you. Our, Drake is an R open sci package. It was onboarded and, and peer reviewed by the, the amazing folks at R open sci. They've done a whole lot to, to spread the word about Drake and its other packages, and they've been a fantastic community to, to, to share ideas and, and um, provide support and energize and catalyze the discourse. Thanks also to Edgar Ruiz and Matt Dancho for the, for the examples. So this deep learning case study was based on a blog post by Matt. It's on the, the RStudio blog and it goes into more depth about the, the, the methodology and the story behind the use case. And thanks so much to Edgar for putting together Matt's blog post with the Drake package. This, it, made, it, it made a huge difference in this workshop. Um, and lastly, thank you to everybody who has contributed issues and pull requests and, and asked for things and identified bugs here. It's been, it's the, development, the developer and user community has been extremely helpful and I've learned a ton from everyone. I recognize some of the folks in the, in the list of participants who, who, have, uh, who I've talked to actually fairly recently on the, the Drake issue tracker 
about uh, about some of these things. So uh, big thanks to those of you who are who are listening in here. And with that, I am ending the presentation portion of this short course. The rest of the the rest of the of the tutorial is going to be more hands-on and interactive. So you're going to be working with our notebooks and shiny apps and going through exercises. And I'm going to be here to answer questions and provide help one-on-one. -on -one. You can either uh, just ask your questions. Um, you can un unmute yourself to ask verbally, or you can write in the chat and I'll see. And um, if you were to take the, the tutorial, the workshop yourself, after we're done here, you can do that. You can sign up for an RStudio Cloud account. You can log into this, this workspace link, which is also linked from the tutorials development page. And you can work through the notebooks in order. The notebooks will direct you to various Shiny apps. And so this, this workshop is already available. But you got me here, and I'm going to help you one-on-one -on -one, um, through this. And the, the exercises take you through this example and the slides go through the building blocks and build up the, the workflow gradually and explore the features of, of Drake as, as code and data change. And with that, I'd actually like to encourage you to go to a different set of, of infrastructure that we've set up specifically for this purpose because we expected a lot of participants. This infrastructure uh, base is backed by our studio and it allows, it, it'll allow for a greater number of participants at higher performance. Um, so I'm going to, if I can find the chat, I will try to enter it here. For some reason, when I shared my screen, it, it um, took away the, it took away the chat window. So I'm gonna stop sharing right now and I'm going to paste these instructions. So the steps to getting started with this workshop are in the chat right now. And I will share my screen again to walk you through them right here. So if everybody could follow along and set this up, and if you could have something to write with, that would also that will also help you. So, because there are credentials that that uh, that are worth keeping track of here. So, what I'm going to ask you to do is log into. It's not uh, pasting correctly, but yeah. If you would all go to this URL, I know there's a redirect, but uh, it's just our studio slash class, enter Q3 underscore learn Drake. This is the workshop identifier. And if you click submit, it'll ask you for your full name and email. and then submit that. It'll give you these credentials. I, if, if you would all copy them and write them down, they're gonna be different for each participant. So um, you're going to have your own instance of RStudio Cloud to work with. You copy down those credentials, then what you can do is you can head over to this link here to your workspace. It may take a while. Um, so while it's loading, I'll just say that, oh, it's, it's up. So if you select RStudio Server Pro and enter your credentials, learn Drake user and learn Drake pass. If you log in, you'll need to click 
a button to start a new session. And then you should be in a, in a workspace, an RStudio Cloud workspace with the, all the notebooks for the tutorial pre-populated. You'll go into the first notebook, which is called one-functions.rmd. And once you'll get in here, I know I'm showing a, a local copy. You'll, you'll see a file system like this, go into one-functions, click one-functions.r project. I'm already in this project, which is why it's just reading the options. Um, you'll do that and, oh, have I not been sharing this whole time? Just ask me to share. Um, anyway, um, if, if, um, if the goal is to, to log into the, the workspace and to open this first notebook, that's where we're going to start. Um, and once you get here, let's see. Once you get to the, the, the notebook with, that goes through the functions, that's where we'll, we'll start the, the hands-on portion. Um, let's see. So while, that, while, while that's getting set up for everyone, I'd like to, to take a moment to uh, answer some of your questions. I'll have a little Q&A session, and then we'll go into the, the notebooks. Are there any questions? Anything that I missed? Anything that didn't go through? Or just questions about Drake, suggestions about Drake, uh, things of that nature? And again, you can either um, put this in, in the chat or, or just unmute yourself and, and ask. They see there's also a raise hand feature. Okay, so the question, is the plan built up manually? Yes, for the, for the most part, at least, at least to start all the plan, all the Drake plan is, is constructed manually. So um, you'll, you'll write individual targets, individual commands in that Drake plan function to build up that plan data frame. Later on, we're, we're gonna go over, over some ways to shortcut this process. So there is, there is what's called static branching. And there's a, there's a chapter in the manual about this. Um, let's see. There's a, there's a chapter in the manual on static branching, which we'll, and we'll get to some exercises on that um, pretty soon. Well, later on, actually. Um, So this is this chapter, chapter five of the of the of the manual, describes all this um, ways to ways to shorten down a big complex plan like this, so you don't have to write every single every single target out manually. Um, there's also a dynamic version of this dynamic branching, which we'll we'll hopefully also get to. Um, okay, another question: Is it possible to combine Drake with Bookdown? So the way I generally think about literate programming and artifacts like this is that um, is is that maybe it's the and and I'll hopefully get to this in the last chapter of the of the workshop. So it's it's um, it's certainly possible. The way I think of the, to to combine these two different toolkits best is to is to have Drake do the heavy lifting. So long computation and orchestration of, of targets. And then you have a bunch of data objects as, as output. And then you'll have a target to, 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 to draw from those targets in the book down book itself and to, and to render it. And then a target at the very end to then deploy it as a, as a, a website or, or uh, 
or just or, or publish the document in another in another way, whether it's you know on online through GitHub or or an R Studio Connect um, artifact. We'll get to some examples of smaller smaller literate programming documents, hopefully. So there's there's a way that Drake automatically interacts with with report with R Markdown reports in general, and hopefully that can be useful. Are there any other questions? Are there any questions about getting started with the, the workspace and the notebooks? Okay, with that, I would say if you could um, log into your workspace, open up the, the first notebook on the functions. We're gonna spend about 10 to 15 minutes here. And this notebook is just to dive deeper into the specific functions that I mentioned briefly in the presentation. So it's gonna go over these seven different functions with our data sets and analyses and summaries. And some functions call other functions because we're breaking things down into pieces. But you'll get, you'll get a, a sense of how this workflow is organized and what, what the code base is actually doing. These are the, the building blocks of, of the work. Oh, sorry. I, um, for some reason, Zoom is a bit difficult to, um, I'm using Zoom on a different machine than I usually do. So the, the screen sharing is, is a little different. So uh, I should be sharing now. And the, so we're gonna go into this, into this notebook and we're going to go. We're going to give you an opportunity to to work through the functions, work through the, the examples, and there aren't any actual exercises other than just running the code chunks. So you're going to start by by running these these code chunks, maybe playing around with the functions, and then the the actual exercises that that I'm going to ask you to do: write little bits of code, answer questions here and there. Those are going to be later notebooks. So I will check. In again in 15 minutes or 10 or in, I'll, I'll check back in 10 minutes and if you if you are um, please let me know if you if you complete early and, and um, if you you have questions it helps me sort of gauge the, the timing every audience is different um, feel free to go at your own pace if you want to but I'll try to keep sort of a, a default pace for the whole group so we can so I can explain things and Q&A will make, make a bit more sense.
So questions are coming up about the, the, the CUDA and TensorFlow messages that you get when, when fitting models. And those, um, most of those, in fact, all those you can, you can, you can, you can ignore safely. Um, there are messages about compilation on different architectures that are, that, and possible inefficiencies that, that can come from that. Um, as long as the, the funnels, um, you can, you can ignore those and, and be fine. Uh, if, you're, if you're seriously using TensorFlow on other machines, you're probably going to want to to use the, the GPU version and um, compile it to run fast. But here is just pedagogical for the purposes of, of teaching Drake. And so as long as it's returning results, then we'll be safe. We'll be fine. So how's everybody doing on that first notebook? Do we need more time? Do we need less time? Um, we've been working on this for about 12 or so minutes. Um, so be happy to answer more questions or um, go right to the next phase or spend a little more time here. Are you uh, in the middle of the notebook, or if some people finish, all done? One person's all done? Yeah, thanks for uh, responding in the chat with that. Um, it helps. And like I said, every, every group is different. Um, some people speed through this right away. Others need a little bit more time. Um, I figure that those of us who, who, uh, who, who make the effort to go out of our way to attend a, a workshop at an R conference can probably uh, find this a little bit more familiar, um, but I don't know. So you've got one person who's almost done. Um, so maybe another another uh, minute or so. Any any questions um, on on this on this notebook? So going forward, we don't really need to to understand every little detail about the the functions. What I'm I'm mostly looking to convey here is just the, the general layout of the way we break down the problem. And um, you, you might want to take away for, for your own work some of the stuff about recipes and, and tidy models that, that, uh, that, that's here. Uh, it could generalize beyond just, just deep learning. Um, but, uh, but yeah, just, um, just an understanding of the functions that we have and the functions that we're going to use in the Drake plans that we built up um, is, is going to is going to support the the other notebooks that we that we go forth and and, uh, and do. Great. So I'm seeing that most people who responded are done, and so let's. Um, I believe I'm still sharing. So let's move on to the next notebook. So this you're going to go into this two dash plans folder. Um, the solutions are next to it if you if you want to look after we're done. Um, but go to two dash plans, and there's a different R project that we're going to open. So I click on this and confirm it. That'll restart the session. And if you open up 2-plans.rmd, that's going to have the next exercises. And here's where it's going to start being interactive because there are going to be places where you'll need to insert code for, for the, the plan to work. So first we'll start out as usual, confirm you're in the correct working directory, load all the, the options, including the Drake package, and then go forth and complete the exercises. And the exercises focus on building up the plan gradually, adding a couple targets, running what we have so far, inspecting the results, adding some more targets, this gradual approach that you can you can do to make things to break things down, make them more make them easier to manage because 
we're, we're not running everything from scratch the whole, the entire time. That, that allows us to do this. So this is exactly what I spent most of the slides doing. Um, so we start with this, with this plan here, and then to add more targets, there are going to be, there are going to be places like here where you're going to, to need to insert some R code to define the new targets, make sure the dependency relationships are correct, and then run the new targets that, that we have. And um, you'll see these, these your turn markers to where, where you need to insert that code. And we're gonna spend we're going to spend about, uh, I, I expected with, with other groups that this can take about 10 to 20 minutes or so. Um, so just let me know where, where, you, where everyone is, where, where you are in, in the notebook. I really appreciate uh, those, of, those of you who chimed in and said, you know, yes, I'm done with, with uh, the first notebook. That really helped, um, that really helped time things. If you would uh, let me know about the second notebook, that would, that would, uh, help move things along and make what I'm saying relevant to you guys. Uh, yeah, so this is where, this is the first part of the workshop. We were actually you know, coding in Drake, so uh, work through this notebook and let me know if you have questions along the way. Um, there's, there's plenty of room just to ask, uh, to ask questions and, and things like that. So I'm seeing somebody saying it's, it's still loading. Does it mean it, it hangs or you have to restart? Um, restarting isn't a bad idea. Um, it's, 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 it's not a, it's not a bad idea. I'm, I'm saying feel free to, feel free to go and restart. If, if, um, that helps, you can, you can either, you can either restart your browser or you can log out and lock that log back in. If you, if you save your credentials or just start a new workspace entirely. Um, the folks at, at our studio have done a great job to set up our, our infrastructure make sure it, it scales to them or people and it's high, reasonably high performance. So um, yeah, it should work if you restart again.
So a great question just came up. Uh, is there any specific reason for assignment with the equal sign as opposed to the um, assignment or uh, as um, equals or arrow interchangeably in the code? Um, in the in the Drake plan itself, you're really defining um, you're you're defining um, you're defining objects within within a different um, in inside a, a domain specific language that defines the the plan data structure. Um, that's so equal signs are important there because it's it's sort of its own Drake plan is really its own language on the inside. Uh, everywhere else, it, it just it doesn't really matter, but um, but it's good practice to use use the the arrow just because that's um, if if you want to follow a, a code style that's that's sort of more universal and that's um, easier for others to read, the arrow is uh, more accepted in the art community, I believe. So I guess in in plans inside the Drake plan function, it's kind of it's more like the the code style is it looks like you're you're defining your arguments to a function rather than um, assigning objects. And that's it's kind of because you're you're working inside a call to the Drake plan function. It's just that's um, that's more of a standard way to write it. And in, in sort of outside a function call, um, the arrow is is um, stylistically more widely used.
Great question. So I just got a question in the chat asking to explain the, the read and load functions a bit more. And these functions are designed to, to get existing targets from the, from the data store, from the cache. And so if we I go ahead and run the first plan that we have, I can show you. I believe I'm still sharing my screen. Oh. Great. Sorry, just getting set up here. So if we have if we have targets in in the cache, then read is going to retrieve one of these data objects from storage. So if we read churn data. That's going to return it as a value. So we can assign it to a variable, and then reference that variable. And so that's that's just how read works. Load just. It's, it's similar, but it assigns the object to, to the target name in memory. So right now, churn data. So churn data is not, it's, 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 it's not a variable yet. We don't have a value assigned to it. But if we say load churn data, then we have this object in memory here. And if we call load with no arguments, it's just gonna load all the targets in the cache. So we not only have churn data, we also have churn recipe, um, as, as well as any other targets that may have existed in storage. So this, the, the, the reason why we have these functions is, is because we have these targets, and these targets get put in the, in, in the data store in cache, and we want convenient ways to retrieve them back from, from storage because they aren't just simple files. So Drake uses a package called store, uh, spelled S-T-O-R-R, to, um, to, to store the, the return values of the targets. And so you'll notice if we, if we list the hidden files, there's this file called .drake that's actually a folder and that contains all of the all the data from our targets. But when we look at what's inside here, there's there's actually a lot more to it than just a folder with target names. There's in fact there's it has a whole bunch of cryptically named hashes here. So in order to actually load the data, we have to go through um, the store package itself or these, these convenient functions to get them from, from memory. Also, thanks for, uh, let me know if that doesn't uh, answer your question. Um, I can go into more detail if, if you'd like or, or backtrack and explain other things. Um, thanks, for, um, thanks for letting me know you're done and I'm glad the recovery thing is, is, uh, is helpful. The data recovery partially makes up for the fact that this format for data storage isn't really that friendly to version control. So if you're, if you're familiar with Git and GitHub, um, what, what you want to do for a project is, is, at least for the code, you want to put the code under version control and upload it to GitHub or, or GitLab or another version control system so that you uh, so that, you, so that your, your project is safe somewhere that you trust and you can go back to previous, previous versions. This format with, all, with these cryptically named files and a lot of, of data is, is not very friendly to version control because it, it's just, it's, they're large files and things get messy pretty easily. So data recovery in Drake is, is one way to make up for that. If, you're, if your project is, is local, um, you don't necessarily need a version control system like Git to, to go back to a previous iteration of the, of the project. Uh, 
so it's a it's a workaround and it's a workaround that 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 uh, that helps. So we've uh, been working on this notebook for a while. I'd just like to check in and see if uh, see where people uh, check on check on people's progress. I see a bunch of uh, some some people are done. Maybe not everyone. Um, so if you're comfortable sharing in the chat where you are, if you're not done, um, or just message me privately that you need more time, uh, feel free feel free to do so. I see most people are done. Uh, we're going to give a couple more minutes for the people who are finishing up. You got a question, is Drake leading to IBM SPSS modeler fashion? Um, so Drake is is our focused. It's um, I mean certainly other languages like SPSS are possible to integrate with Drake if if you track the code the, the scripts like an SPSS script as a as a data file. Um, certainly some of my earlier collaborators have done that with with uh, SQL files for working with databases and. That seemed to work reasonably well. Uh, does that does that answer your question? Let me know if it uh, if you'd like me to if I if I didn't uh, answer that well. Um, another great question is there is there any suggested sync system for Drake for Drake files in the cache? Um, that's an excellent question. It's actually something that's that's fairly difficult in Drake because of how because of the default cache system, it's pretty heavy in storage, especially. Especially because of because it doesn't actually delete data very often. I mean, it avoids duplicating data, but if you're um, unless you garbage collect the cache, and there are ways to do that, that it leaves a lot uh, behind. So um, data recovery is the silver lining in this. It's sort of uh, making making lemonade out of lemons as far as that uh, the storage uh, situation goes, but that means that it's because of the size and storage. It means it's harder to transport caches from one system to another. Um, Dropbox and Box and OneDrive are pretty good for those because they. I mean, Drake has a lot of tiny, tiny files, so it'll take a little bit of time to sync, but it does. It does get the job done. Um, it. It's. And it, I think. I've. I, I haven't. I, I think that it's because of the 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 large. Number number of files and the in the large size of those files, I think those platforms are pretty well suited to that. Um, Noam Ross had an example where he he has a, a nice nice example for um, for packaging up and archiving entire Drake caches. And I'm gonna try to find it here in the chat uh, and post it in the chat. This is an example with Drake and Docker and GitLab. So if the cache is small enough, you can actually you can actually zip it up, and you can archive it and even even um, tell the the continuous integration service that you're that you're running on if you're using that to um, to save it as an artifact. And I just copied a couple links in the chat to uh, for um, his example of that. But a lot of times in, in, in situations at my own work, cache sharing, we collaborate on projects. We, we, we work a lot on, on 
um, modeling and simulating um, modeling and simulating clinical trials. We do we do that a lot for my for my work, and it's projects with a lot of data and tight timelines, and we don't really have the the time or space to ship large caches around, but there are oftentimes just a few final artifacts that we want to share, a few final artifacts that end up being important. And so, and so what we can do is reproducibly export a file from, from a, a Drake workflow to have a target at the end that writes a file and tracks it. And that, that piece is often just a data set with all the required information used that we need to come up with some post-processing summaries. And that's, and that we can share a bit more easily. Um, so sometimes it's best to just kind of do a, do a hybrid approach. Um, so do you, another question, do you have an opinion about if I should or should not get ignore the cache? I recommend in almost all cases that you ignore that cache just because it, the size blows up pretty quickly and so does the number of files. Um, and Unless you, once you commit that cache, unless you rebase the, the commits, you're kind of, it's, it's almost like a curse because every time you clone that project, it's cloning the, the entire repository because, uh, because Git is, is decentralized by design. And so once you, once you have that data committed, um, it's hard to remove that commit history to remove that large data. Um, plus the, the commit history for those, those uh, tiny files is a bit harder to look at. So for, for Drake specifically, I would recommend that you ignore the cache. You get ignore the cache, um, unless you have a good reason to, um, to, to, do, to, to not ignore it in your specific use case. And there should be a get ignore file inside the .drake folder um, already. So to keep you from accidentally committing that, that, whole, that whole cache. These are great questions. Thank you for, for uh, speaking up. And so last time I checked, I think that most people were almost done with the notebook. So th I think this is a good time to move on to our next phase. Um, one more question though, before we, before we move, move on. Um, so if you fit multiple Bayesian models and you wanna be able to get back posteriors from several different ones, do you recommend saving? manual RDS files or model fits with functions or loading them up later to avoid clogging up the cache? Okay, so great question. This is very, I'm gonna answer that before we move on because this is, this is really close to my wheelhouse. We, um, in, in my work, we fit lots of Bayesian models. We fit them over and over again. So not only do we have tens of thousands of posterior samples from a Bayesian model, we have, we have thousands of model fits. And so we need to think about how to manage the, the output of that uh, effectively, um, you can you, you have a couple of choices here. If you think you can store that data, um, first of all, I would I would avoid committing posterior samples to to Git and GitHub. Um, so no matter no matter where you you have you have those, that's just that's a lot of of data. Um, and so, what I would do first of all, if you end up committing if you end up storing posterior samples to the data store, I would read to the cache um, as targets, as return values from targets, I would think very carefully about the, the format that you store those. Because if you store them as RDS files, because of the gzip compression that goes on, it can, it can uh, take a long time if you don't, if you don't compress them. I, I think, so, so Drake definitely does um, try to compress those, those uh, data sets, but, you're, if you do store posterior samples, you're almost always, um, you're gonna almost always want to choose a specialized data format and try to find where, okay, special data formats for, for targets. Um, so if you're storing a lot of posterior samples or a lot of data, you're gonna wanna define, you're gonna wanna wrap that command in the target function and you're gonna wanna choose a, a format like FST or better, better yet, FST TBL. And what this assumes is that you have a data frame of the, you have a data frame uh, returned by your target. And because it's a data frame, you can use the FS, 
Drake uses, um, when you select format equals FST, Drake uses the FST package to store the data in, in a very efficient uh, compressed format. And not only is it dramatically smaller in storage, it takes far less time. So for one and a half gigs of data, it's, it's over 10 times faster to, to store. Um, and this is extremely helpful if you really do need the posterior samples of each model. Um, if you want to return a CODA MCMC list, you could also, you, you can no longer use the FST format. You'll have to use the, the QS format instead. Um, and I don't have a sense, a good enough sense of, of how efficient FST versus QS is, um, but uh, either, either in storage or, or in speed, but both are, are options to try. Um, but really the best advice I can give you in Bayesian context is to avoid st storing posterior samples um, if you don't actually need them. So I would get your, your model output, uh, but if you don't really need those posterior samples, I would instead store the store summary statistics like uh, quantiles of posterior distributions, like uh, um, you, you, you might want 50% or 95% credible intervals, or you might want posterior means and medians, um, potential scale reduction factors, maybe you want, um, I would definitely throw in effective sample size uh, as well to make sure to, as a convergence diagnostic, but things like that, and maybe just one row per, per target with that summary level information is great for um, Bayesian data analysis to avoid clogging the cache, like you said. Um, Okay, I bet I went on a bit longer of a tangent than I meant to on that. Let's get to the next part of the of the of the workshop, and this is where this is where Drake re, the, the usefulness of Drake really becomes apparent. So we're gonna now we've built up the workflow, right? So we're gonna we're gonna go back to this project and we're gonna explore what happens when you make changes when you. Um, when you change a model, when you change some code, when you change some data, what happens if you, um, if you, what, what does Drake do to react to that situation? And so what I'm gonna have everyone do is go to the three dash changes folder and open this R project, the three dash changes project. And it may take a little bit of time to switch, but you're gonna be in the correct working directory with all of your materials set up for you. And you're going to be doing some some custom coding. Um, you have some, so you have the the functions and packages and plan already set up in this R folder, and you have scratch work. So you have this this R script and this notebook, whatever you prefer. If you prefer to write in in notebooks, you can open this one. If you prefer to to write in scripts, you can you can use uh, this script. Either way, I would go to, I would open this up, open this project and go to this three dash and go to this, um, this shiny app that's, that I'm posting in the chat right now. And so this will have some guided exercises for you to follow along, follow along with. So, so our studio has thankfully backed the deployment of of these of these shiny apps, and this one is a tutorial. So I, you would, what I what I'll ask you to do is keep this workspace in a cloud open, but go through these exercises, these um, these questions, and it'll tell you. Okay, so source the um, options and source the scripts. You would just uh, follow the directions, and it'll ask you to make. Um, the, the questions will ask you to make changes, and then you'll have to um, think about sort of, okay, well, what did Drake do, and why did, why did Drake behave the way it did? Um, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll get an understanding of what, is, what Drake is doing when you change things in your workflow, why it does what it does, and how it saves you, how it saves you time, and how you can use it to save time effectively uh, when, you're, when you're updating your workflow. And this one usually takes a bit longer. There are, there are quite a number of questions and some things may be counterintuitive at first. And so I'll be here to, to ask questions. I'll check in where everybody is in about 15 minutes, but 
Um, but I'm expecting this to take a bit longer than the, than the others.
So how's everyone doing with the exercises? Anyone uh, halfway or all the way done or Yeah, thanks for the responses. Um, so it looks like somewhere between half to two thirds of the way, mostly at half, um, maybe a little less. That's good, that's good. Um, I'm, I'm expecting this to take a lot of time. This is a really important part of the, uh, of the, of the exercises and um, really gets you uh, to experience how Drake works. Um, yeah, let me know if, it, well, I'll check back in uh, with uh, just a, a little chat about progress and maybe uh, five or ten more minutes. Um, in the meantime, don't hesitate to to keep reaching out. So we got a great question about the message unloading one target or uh, unloading two targets. Um, so when, when you run the make function, um, Drake assumes that all your targets have unique names and all the objects in your environment have unique names. Uh, and so because of its, its assumptions, it doesn't allow target names to share the names with, with variables that you define in your session, so it automatically unloads them. Um, and to avoid surprises, it just tells you what's going on. So in the world of pipeline toolkits and in functional programming in general, there's a concept called immutability, which is just a fancy term for objects are created once and then they are not modified. And, they're, um, and so this, this assumes that, um, and it, this, is, this is part of that assumption where because every target kit is, is created once and not modified, its, its name is, is unique and um, it's, it can't be over, overwritten. Um, to avoid having to overwrite um, an object in when it creates that target, it just, it just makes sure that no other target shares that name or no other object shares that name when it, uh, when it starts.
The question about debugging when targets are unexpectedly outdated. So that's a, that's a great one. Um, and I agree, it does, it does get tricky because there's, um, yeah, it's, it, it can be, it can be tough to, to track that down sometimes. I would, the first step I would do is to visualize the graph, which, which you've already been doing with VizStraight Graph. Um, sometimes that'll give you an indication of, of why, of why targets are, are out of date. There's also this function called um, depth profile. And if I run that, let's see. Um, if I run this pipeline for, for a second and then demonstrate that, it, it might become clear. So So there are ways to, to get a sense overall of, of what might have changed uh, as, far as, as far as dependencies are, are concerned. Okay, so now that we've run the pipeline, we can say, okay, what's the depths profile? Um, and we have to supply the target name. Um, best model, yeah, best run, and then our plan. And it'll tell you at a high level if, if I mean, why why a target may be outdated. It'll tell you if the command has changed in some way or if a dependency has changed or input or output file has changed or you selected a custom random number generator seed, um, almost all the time, it's gonna be this depend. Um, it, it's going to be this depend um, trigger that is, that is activated because you may have changed a function or a, or a code base or, or something else in your code base. Um, there's also this, let's see if I, So if you're, if you're kind of wondering, okay, well, a dependency change, it could be a function, it could be another target. The depths target function can sometimes help with this. And so it will, it'll list the, the dependencies of this target from the information in the plan, and it'll show you, it'll show you the hashes of each of those. It's not gonna show you the previous hash because Drake doesn't keep track of, of those except in, in history, but this, if you, if you run it once, you observe one hash, run another time, observe another hash for a dependency, then, then that, might, um, that might give you some indication of what, what makes a target outdated. But um, other, than, other than that, those are, so those are the tools that Drake's provide, Drake provides specifically to, to help you with that. Um, otherwise, it's, it's generally a hard problem to backtrack that. And I've been, I've been kind of working on that, but um, but it's 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 sometimes that sometimes that helps, sometimes that's not sometimes it's it's not always as uh, as satisfying as you'd like it to be. Okay, a bunch of people are chiming in that they're done. Thank you for that, uh, for letting for letting us know. Um, so. Anyone else need more time? Anyone else done with the exercises? Great. So I'm gonna I'm going to if there if there are no more questions, and please feel free to chime in in the chat again with with more questions. I'm going to um, just ad address a couple of the a couple of the the previous questions, which I think were super important about okay, well, what happens if a function is unexpectedly outdated? Or, um, or, or why is it sort of unloading targets from the environment? Um, you'll notice from the exercises, one of the things the questions tries to make clear is that, is that the functions that Drake tracks are the functions in your session that are currently loaded into memory and not necessarily the functions that are in the scripts. So in your, in your functions.r. 
So when I first created Drake, I thought that, okay, we need a pipeline tool that is not totally committed irrevocably to, to configuration files and script files and things like that. We, we want something that's not explicitly file-based. That's where I was coming from when I created this. But there are certain, there are certain ways that I've learned where that's, it's made that difficult. So the, the fact that functions can become unexpectedly outdated because your global environment may be really busy or you may have a stale session, you may have made a change in your global environment and forgot about, um, forgot about other changes that you may have made. And so what I highly recommend you do in practical projects is if you're using the traditional setup that I've been, I've been showing, is if you restart your R session every time you want to run make, the make function. So I recommend restarting your session and then, and then sourcing your, your functions all over again and your plan all over again, and then calling the make function. And that's, that's to ensure that you'll just have a fresh clean session that when your targets are up to date, you, you can trust that, that your, that's, be, that's due to the fact that you have an updated set of, of underlying persistent scripts and then when you leave this project alone and then come back to it, then your, your target should still be up to date. So restarting your session is, is, is important for, for serious projects. And there's, there's actually, what this leads to is, is a different set of functionality that, that I developed on top of what Drake already has, uh, what Drake originally had that that automatically spins up a new background process to, to do this for you, sourcing all the scripts and then running the make function. Um, so to make, to, to, to use Drake in a way that's more reproducible, that creates a fresh new clean session every time, there's this, there's this chapter in the manual, chapter, chapter seven goes over this, there's this safer interactivity session uh, section and describes some of the problems with unexpected function invalidation. And the adjustment is pretty much just, you define this, this configuration file call, called underscore drake.r. And inside this underscore drake.r, it's basically like your, your top level run everything scripts where you define, if I, if I, if I uh, create this new script, what I do is I define an underscore drake.r with that sources everything and then calls this instead of make you're going to call this function called drake config and it's this it's it's this internal preprocessing function but you use it here instead of the make function um, just because um, this this configuration file supports multiple different kinds of functions and not just the make function so Drake config takes all the same arguments that the make function takes. So usage is, is exactly the same. And once this file is here, you can call r underscore make. And what this does is it defines, it spins up, like I said, a background process. So you'll get different kinds of console output and it'll run everything uh, from that fresh session. So if I run it again, It'll reload those scripts. Those it'll, re, it'll reload those packages again because it started from from a, a fresh session. And not only do you have R underscore you have have the same you have the same function family for um, for variations on that same theme. So you have you have versions of that for R, for outdated and this Drake graph and other, other functions that require the plan, that require some degree of, of pre-processing on those, on those functions in your environment. And, and see, so using this family of functions, you get a, you get a consistent sort of set of, of behavior that revolves around this configuration file and this persistent um, reproducible session management. So I, I highly recommend that for, for practical uh, projects. Um, I don't I don't usually teach it right away because it's usually simpler to get started with the make function, but for serious projects, I would define a, a underscore drake.r this way and rely on the interface that, that supports that, that that revolves around that um, because of what you've learned in the in the exercises.
Any more questions to, to follow up, either that or any exercises or anything else? All right, just let me know if you have them. We are going to move on to the next section of, of the tutorial. So as you may have guessed, we're going to go into four dash static. And there's really not much here except a set of scratch workspaces. Um, most, of, most of this is going to be in an interactive app. So if you would go to the link in the chat, um, to get started, that would that that is where the exercises live. There's also a helper app called Drake Planner. It's going to make these exercises a whole lot easier. And I just copied that into the chat as well, so you can take a look. I would open up both of these links right now and let those apps initialize. So you probably don't even need your cloud workspace for this, but please keep it open because we're going to come back to it. And you may still want to use it. You may still prefer it. So this addresses the question early on, which is a great question for this workshop of, okay, do you, do you need to write the whole plan manually? Do you need to type in every single target? And up until this point, the answer has been yes. But what if you have hundreds of targets or thousands of targets, and you, uh, which I don't necessarily recommend all the time because then Drake starts to starts to lag a little bit because of the overhead. So you can, if you can condense things down to smaller numbers of targets, that's um, maybe a couple hundred. That's that's usually pretty good. But even then, it's it's it can be hard to write out everything explicitly. Hand, by by hand, um, it can get quite cumbersome. And so there's this shorthand that, that Drake supports called static branching. And there's a whole chapter on static branching in the manual. And if you think that you're going to use this for your projects, I highly recommend it. It's just chapter five in this link. I'm going to also put this in the chat. Um, so and this, this set of exercises is hopefully a more gentle, hands-on introduction to all that for our deep learning use case. It's a static branching is a shorthand that allows you to accomplish, you know, to define more targets with, with, with a lot less typing. Um, and so what I do, if, if I were you, is, is go to this, uh, this app and and proceed to the exercises. So it's the exercises are going to be of, a, of this form. So you're going to, going to um, you're going to get this this plan that you're that you're tasked to create, and this graph of what it's supposed to look like. And you go down here, and you're expected to fill in um, fill in the blank to uh, to construct this plan, and it'll tell you if if you're if you need to go back and try again. Um, what helps is either define this plan in your local session or just use the Drake Planner app. So I can, I can paste a plan inside here and um, it'll give me warnings if, if, if it needs to, but you can see what this plan already looks like when, once you paste it in. And it allows you to iterate on plans. Maybe I go back, maybe I, I change something, I change um, these unit parameters and update. And maybe I have fewer activation functions, and it'll have fewer targets. And yeah, so I would go ahead and 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 log into these into these apps and work through the exercises. Um, again, this is another long one, so I'll check back every ten minutes about timing. But we can we can spend a, a quite a bit of, of time here, and it'll be well worth it.
Okay, how are we on the exercises for static branching? Are we about uh, halfway through? Third of the way? That's good. Third to a half? Yeah, we're doing really well on time overall, so we can spend uh, we can spend quite a bit here. And external symbols is halfway. The connection issues. Okay, so add external symbols seems to be uh, pretty common. Yeah, um, yeah. If you have questions, uh, yeah, still be happy to, to take them. Um, So it looks like the, so to make sure, I, I, it sounds like the, the, um, the app with the static branching exercises may be having some trouble. Um, so I guess as um, there, there is a way that you can launch these apps locally from your cloud workspaces, if this gets to be too much of a problem. I would say usually you can, in, in most cases, you can probably reset your, um, just refresh the browser and it's it's probably gonna solve it for that exercise. It really shouldn't take more than a second or two to to refresh, uh, to, to run the, the solutions. Um, but you can, you can do, um, so the, this, this workshop is all part of a package called Learn Drake. And if you go to your cloud workspace, which I'm sharing now, you can actually do something like Learn Drake. Yeah, I called it Launch App. And the app that you want to supply is Learn Drake Static. It's an R Markdown Learn R tutorial. It your browser may block a pop up, but if you if you go into if you're using Chrome, you can select to allow it, 
and then click try again in this dialog box. And that's actually hosting the app locally from the from your from your cloud instance. Um, and so all these exercises should still should still work if the if the app itself has trouble. And then when you're done, if you if you hit stop, you can disconnect that server. Yeah, so just please keep me posted on on what's uh, going on with the apps if you're if you're having trouble, and um, yeah, especially please tell me if it doesn't resolve with a simple refresh. If you're if you're stuck, uh, I've I've got a at least one more workaround in addition to running locally from the from your your cloud instance. So yeah, just tell me if the if the problem is um, if the problem is is quick and it and it uh, it resolves with the refresh. That's one thing. But if it's uh, if if it keeps if it keeps persisting and never okay. So for at least one person, um, the reload did not work. Uh, starting over did, um, and the questions are independent, so that's probably fine. But uh, yeah, if the, if these problems are insur insurmountable, then we can just try to host the app from from different places. Um, it's it's hosted in two different places. I'd rather not use the second location, but if we have to, then then that's fine. Just let me know. So we had a question about using uh, an, ob the ob an object with the semicolon and without, uh, with and without, an object with and without the, the semicolon in the transform in one of the exercises. Um, yeah, if you would elaborate on that on that question and and point me to the exercise, that would that would help. Um, transform equals. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. So there's a, a question of so if you're in the middle of a, let's see, let me find those those questions so it'll be it'll be a bit clearer. Oops.
Okay, I think most of you are past this exercise. So it's, I think it's okay to, to give away the answer here. Um, so let me just read the latest comments so I understand. Okay, I'll, I'll try to answer this first question in first. So if you, so, so the, the Drake, Drake plan is really, it's not exactly entirely pure R code. It's a domain specific language, which means it's, it's its own language built on top of, on top of what R is already doing. And it has its own syntax and it has its own standards and ways of interpreting uh, the symbols and syntax. So if you were to write something like a map over these symbols, what you get is if you map over, if you define uh, this a target with this command sort of template and instead of literally saying fun run, you, you loop through these these, these symbols, what you get is a command here where each symbol takes its turn being replaced as the, as the, as the, the placeholder, the grouping variable. And you get differently named targets because of that as well. And that's, that's a valid use of, the, of, of static branching. Um, if you were to do, and, be, and that's, um, let's see. And because you're, you're writing this literally as, as symbols inside a map statement in, in the, the transform argument of, of target, it's going to interpret these as, as symbols um, because there's no, there's no tidy valuation, there's no bang bang. Um, and so it's, it's just going to, to loop through these literal symbols here. Um, if you were to let's see a larger map, that exercise. Um, okay. Um, if you were, these, these character strings are also language. They are literally, um, a bunch of, of characters instead of symbols and Drake interprets those as symbols and then, and plugs those in to the act one argument at each, at each iteration. Um, so as far as one to use a semicolon or one to not to answer YBK's question, um, you using a using the um, I'm not sure I understand that. Um, did I please let me know if I didn't answer your question um, based on how I went over those last two two exercises? I'm not. I'm I'm still not sure I under I understood that. Um, we can we can come back to it if you if you uh, um, post more in the in the chat um, that that would that would help I, I think I'm, I'll need a little bit of of, of help understanding that question um, from Malcolm Barrett um, reading reading that question now Yeah, so you can call you can reference earlier variables inside the transport state form statement earlier in the plan, even if they're not actually targets, they're variables that you mapped over previously. So for example, um, in, in one of the exercises, you can sort of in the last exercise, for example, is a good is a good uh, is a good place where this comes up, but um, the, the combined example, well, let's see. You can do things like, like this, and I am, I am improvising here, so it may not work out exactly. Um, just bear with me a second. So if you define a plan like this and you want to add a new target, let's say, call it summary, and you want to map over all the runs, you want to summarize them, 
And you also want to keep track of, for some reason, the uh, you want to keep track of the function that came along with it. So let's say you want to get the name of that function. Um, well, and you want to say transform equals map, and you want to map over run. Let me see if I can diagnose this. This downstream target should substitute the functions that you used for the run target in for this symbol fun run here. So yeah, that's exactly what's happening here. Um, so the summary of good run is going to get this, this function symbol um, inside here. And by the way, if you run dpar substitute, that's just going to get whatever is inside here and return as a character vector. So it's a nice way to, to make a note of the function that called that was called previously in this case. So, and yes, so what Drake does is it keeps track of, it keeps track of the grouping variables that you previously used to define upstream targets here. And a way to, to demonstrate how this works is with the trace argument of the of the plan, so uh, of Drake plan. So if you call if you call ordinary Drake plan, it's just going to give you the target and the command and, and values for custom columns that you may assign. Uh, but if you say trace equal to true, and then run that, it will show you the values of the grouping variables that that get built up over the course of static branching. So Fun run is a grouping variable with these values corresponding to each target. And so is summary actually, because you're you're it becomes a grouping variable that you're that you're if you if you map over something. Um, so this is sort of a way to make that static branching process less mysterious and more concrete. And this is this is how the the targets that you define in static branching can use those grouping variables upstream. If you, in the second part of Malcolm's question, is there a way to see what Drake knows about non-target? Um, yes, I think the trace answers, uh, I think that the trace, the trace in Drake plan exposes what Drake knows about non-target objects like fun run and act since they don't appear in the plan. That's, that is what the trace is for. Um, and I get another, another comment saying, um, when you try fun run equals a uh, character vector, that doesn't work. Um, so it's not using rep, uh, regex. It's not using text analysis. Earlier versions of Drake's interfaces relied on text to wild cards. And that was a little bit more brittle. Um, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, make a clean transition from text manipulation to valid R language. Um, so it's, th this is why it's static code analysis and manipulation of expressions and language objects becomes a little bit more appropriate for this use case. Um, so if we go to, if we try character vectors for each of these, then what happens here is Drake expects those to be, hmm, I guess this does work in a way, but it's still, it's still not recommended.
Okay, and, and general trouble on the external symbols, um, the external symbols question. Let's revisit that. Okay. So we want to make a plan that looks like this. Um, okay, yes, this is the question we just we just visited. So, um, yeah, because this is a, a domain specific language, um, the what we're what we're trying to loop over here is different functions, and those functions need to be symbols. And so, if we write um, if we write those symbols. You could do you could do a, a vector notation or a list notation, and it'll be interpreted the same. Essentially, you say you name all the functions that you're using, and you name the symbol that they're getting substituted in for, which in case which in this case is called fun run. And this is going to create a plan with those symbols inserted. Um, a bit counterintuitive, but it is it is nice in in serious use cases where where you're defining a bunch of functions for different methods. Maybe you you're um, defining entirely different code base bases for different models because if you change one set of functions, then it's only going to invalidate one set of models, and the other set of models are going to stay up to date. Uh, and that's that's a that can that's a, a, a powerful use case for for defining different different kinds of, of functions at the risk of repeating a little bit of code, but not repeating as much documentation. And so this this situation is likely to come up in, in practice and to, to avoid um, unnecessarily rebuilding targets and to save time. Yeah, let me know if that if that helps or doesn't help. Um, I'm happy to elaborate on that. Okay, how how does Arlang Sims work? Okay, that's what are what uh, that's a great question. So I type these in literally. What you could also do is something like. Um, define a variable that turns this character vector into symbols. So into a list of symbols, and then supply that list of symbols directly in here. Now, I'm not mapping over literally the symbol function sims. I want the value in this variable to be inserted into, into the transform statement in the, in the plan. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the tidy valuation bang bang operator, and this will this will tell the plan to use the the value in here in, that this evaluates to instead of just the 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 static symbol function sims. And what's going on here is is as follows. So create a character vector called function names. And when I get the symbols, this is what we have. So we have this is uh, this is a language object. It's a symbol. Um, and you can do that in R. You can um, compute on the on the language in a lot of different ways and that's that's part of how Drake plan works so if you have um, a symbol like if you were to say run if you were to type in some R code like for example run model and you would have some hyperparameters R usually tries to evaluate this right away but what part of Drake does is it allows you to define code up front and delay the evaluation until the right moment. And one way you can do this and experiment for yourself is with the quote function in R. And what this allows you to do is define language objects, what Hadley calls expressions. So 
This is just some, this is an R, uh, this is a language object in R. So, and you can do different things with it. So, this is actually a, a call object. So the first element is gonna be a symbol for the function. Um, you can even turn this into a list. And it's, it's just two elements really. Um, and yeah, it's a language object. It's, it's a, a subclass is a, it's a, its class is, is call. Um, and these objects are really useful for defining domain specific languages like what Drake plan uses. And the, all the, all these transforms are, um, are ways to, to use language to define large numbers of targets. Um, static code analysis and manipulation of language objects and metaprogramming in general, uh, they're a bit involved, but they can, they can help in, in some of these use cases. Um, hopefully this doesn't require too advanced knowledge of, of metaprogramming. I think the, the exercises cover the cover most of the use cases that static branching is going to be for. Yeah, great questions. Is are there is there anything else that that you would like to talk about on on the subject of static branching? And, and is there anyone who needs more time? Okay, so got at least one person is done. At least one person is, is willing to move on. Um, so if we do move on, then there's actually, what we're gonna go to next is an alternative to static branching that came later, which it's, it's um, the more dynamic version of this. It's called, well, it's, it's just called dynamic branching. And uh, it's, it's in a lot of ways easier to use than static branching. It's just, it's historically later in Drake's development. Um, and it's and it, it, because it's easier to use, people can pick it up more quickly on their own, which is why I put it later. Um, but let's, let's go to that now. Um, I'm willing to return to questions about static branching, of course, but uh, in, in the workshop, um, let's, go to, let's go to static branching. So, we're going to go back, well, let's go to dynamic branching rather. So back to our cloud workspace. Let's go back to, let's go to the, the section on, huh. let's go to the five dash dynamic folder. Let's open the, our project. And we're going to return to the uh, to just working with the notebooks. Um, the exercises are still interactive, but not as high tech uh, going forward. So you're going to open this notebook, and it's just like the second notebook that we worked through when we were building up the plan. Um, there, uh, I would go through and, um, yeah, please read the, uh, the pros and run the code chunks to go through the, uh, the tutorial. And when you get to, uh, questions that require custom code, there's a little bit of code to write and, you do have solutions in here. If you're really stuck, you can ask me or you can have a, a peek at this. Um, but there are there is a completed version available for you um, if you need it. And um, yeah, this dynamic branching is all about what happens when you when you want to define a whole collection of targets based on previous work, but 
the targets that you define depend on the value of things, the values of things you computed previously. So if you, if you don't necessarily know what tuning parameters you, you're going to use, what um, maybe, maybe you have this big, long computation in um, an earlier target. Suppose you, you're doing some, some kind of exploratory um, Gaussian process optimization to find the, the learning rates that are best for your, your deep neural nets. And that's, that's prior to the models that you define later. Um, it's impossible with static branching because in static branching, you need to know exactly which targets you're going to run, exactly which models you're going to run before you run the pipeline. But dynamic branching allows you to define targets based on the values of dependencies. So, so you can as the pipeline is running, which turns out to be useful in a lot of, in a lot of situations. It can improve efficiency in a lot of ways. Um, it makes the, the graphs easier to read. So um, yeah, I would say uh, after the after the exercises in, in static branching, you may be pleased with how, how easy this is to use and understand. Um, it relies on less on metaprogramming and manipulation of language objects and more on direct computation on the actual values of targets, which is, which is more intuitive to most people. Um, the, other, the other thing is that static branching and dynamic branching can be used in the same plan together. I don't have examples in this tutorial in particular about how to about how to do that, but static branching is kind of like a layer on top of dynamic branching. So um, you would it's it's good practice in 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 a lot of cases to define targets with both static and dynamic branching in them if you need it, but to but to have the static branching sort of exist as a layer on top of dynamic branching. So you you define bunch of dynamic targets using static branching and then those dynamic targets will then branch when you actually run the pipeline. Anyway, so we'll be working in this notebook for a while um, and yeah, just uh, keep me posted with questions that you have and I'd be happy to work through issues as they come up.
All right, everyone, I think it's a good time to check in and see where we are. Um, if you're willing to uh, share where, done, okay. That's great. Um, anyone else done or anyone else need more time? Yeah, don't, uh, don't hesitate to uh, view the solutions, especially if you get stuck. If you spent a little time, uh, okay, 95%, that means, uh, means it's a good time to maybe wait a, a minute or two. Um, anyone who's, who's done or not done, are there any questions, surprises, issues? So I know towards the end, there's this bit about the trace of dynamic targets, defining a defining a way to keep track of, of where those those sub targets came from, which in, in our case, which activation function contributed to which model. And it can be useful in some cases. In most cases though, it's it's usually better for the sake of, of maintaining an organized project to to avoid the the, the trace and sort of work around it. The trace is great for when you're defining when you're defining objects where it's inconvenient or impossible to assign to assign attributes to the individual targets. But actually, most of the time, uh, it's so it's great that the trace is, is in your toolkit. If you if you have that, you you understand sort of the full capabilities of dynamic branching. But if you if you can, I would recommend that. Um, that you instead define a data structure that's amenable to keeping track of its own metadata. So uh, that's part of why we actually, in this example, return data frames for model runs. It's kind of like what Tidy Models tries to, well, what the, what the Broom package tries to do for, for uh, various, uh, uh, for, for different types of commonly used models in, in, in statistics and R. Um, it's you know, if you return a data frame with not only the model results but the but the hyperparameters in this case or other information that contributed to it, uh, it's it's actually easier to keep track of 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 where targets came from than than defining this this trace variable. Um, the trace is useful when you you actually do want to return model objects and you can't really assign if you're returning the actual Keras model. It's hard to assign. Um, um, uh, a, you know, a, a collection of attributes that describe uh, some of the, the settings that you might have customized. So um, anyway, that's uh, just, a, just a little of, of, little bit of technique there. In my own work, I most often use the dynamic map. I find that, um, I mean, dynamic group was was great to add because it, it allows sort of this this dynamic um, this dynamic version of sort of grouping by something like dplyr or group by. Um, that's something that people have been requesting for a long time. But most, almost all the time, I, I the map sol the dynamic map solves most problems. Does anyone have any questions or issues? All right, in that case, um, yeah, it, are there any objections to moving on? Some cells are stuck and won't fully evaluate. Hmm. Which, which cells specifically? I know this notebook takes a bit longer to evaluate than, than other notebooks.
So it sounds like a lot of people are done already. And since we're nearing the end of the workshop, I guess I'm more, I'm more willing to, to let the people who are done uh, proceed ahead. And um, the people still working on the dynamic branching notebook can choose whether to, to, um, to move on to the next phase or to, to keep working um, or to return to it later. So, um, let's see. So I guess to to make most of to make the most of uh, our time in terms of the for for the to make most of the most of our time for people who are who are done, uh, you can go right ahead to the notebook on files. Actually, let's not uh, open the project just yet. So. Drake has its own particular way of tracking external files. So in Drake, you can, you can accept a data file and track it for changes as we saw with the customer churn.csv file. And in earlier exercises, we explored what happens when we, when we have a data target like that. Uh, we have a, 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 a file that Drake tracks for changes like that and how, and how it's, propagates that change forward through downstream targets. Um, Drake can also track output files and it can track our markdown reports. So you can actually have, you can actually reference upstream targets in an R markdown report and integrate in the, the R markdown report or other kind of knitter document that you have in, inside the plan and you can have a target to actually render that that report and have it re have it re-render automatically when targets change so the way to do that is is um, part of this set of exercises um, and so I, I think this this comes up a lot the way to track files um, the way to track output files and input files and our markdown reports and so with the remaining time, those of you who are, especially those of you who are done with, with dynamic branching and others who think this, this would be more useful in practice, I would go ahead and open up the six dash files, the RMD, our markdown report, and start working through the exercises as, as usual. Um, let me just mention briefly, verbally, explicitly, the, uh, the R markdown piece. So for an R markdown report, um, You'll have, you'll have calls to load and read inside active code chunks. And so what Drake is gonna do is it's gonna go through when you declare this report as, well, first of all, if you, if you run this, this report after you run a Drake pipeline, let's say you, you run everything with your, your model runs and then you come to this report and you wanna summarize your previous work, um, you can call you can write this report and call load run, and you can knit this like you would any other document in the RStudio IDE window. But you can also, and this is, this is preferable for, for Drake workflows, you can actually define it as a target in the plan. And this, and you have um, a knitter in keyword that, that tells Drake to automatically detect those dependency relationships and, and, and enforce this report step to depend on this run target because it was mentioned in this, in this report, this results.rmd report. And um, it's, I use this all the time for, for slide decks, for, for internal purposes and for other kinds of, of presentations or for reports. Um, literate programming in general um, is something that Drake treats a little bit differently than in other use cases. So um, it's common practice in statistics, especially to use an R markdown report as this top level workflow manager. So something that, that just, that you do everything inside an R markdown report. Um, Drake workflows, because of the computational intensity, are oftentimes too ambitious and too big for uh, 
um, to fit it all in a single R markdown report. Um, and our markdown isn't really designed to handle the heavy duty workflows that Drake is designed to handle. And so I would recommend that our markdown reports do as little as possible so that you can already, you can take advantage of the work that you already did when you ran these targets. And this allows the reports to actually, when you run them, they run quickly and you can iterate quickly on them, go back and change the pros. Um, I find this to be easier to use than Knitter's caching system. Uh, I find Drake's caching system to be, to be a lot more fit for purpose, uh, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so in the remaining time, feel free to proceed to the, the files notebook and let me know a few of issues.
And I just want to say thanks everyone for coming. This is this has been great. This, and I hope uh, I hope that the workshop has helped your work. I hope that it's, that you can take things things back that are useful to your your research or your day job. Um, so Alexia linked to a survey um, for the for USAR 2020. If you could uh, fill that out when you get a chance, that would be great. And I will be here for another. Uh, half an hour or so to answer more questions. Um, I see some more questions are coming in. I'll get to that uh, um, in a minute. So, um, and after after this this session is over, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, probably the best way to to track me down for issues that are Drake related is the issue tracker and Drake's development page. So, um, I will link. Link to that in um, soon. I know there are some maintainers who don't necessarily uh, prefer GitHub's issue tracker for just questions and discussion and comments. Um, I really like it because it's easy to share. GitHub makes it easy to share code back and forth and, and even comment on, on closed issues. Uh, so even if I close an issue because I think the original question was already addressed, I'm, I'm uh, more than happy to log back in and, um, and keep the discussion going and, and answer follow-up questions that you have. Um, yeah, and it's uh, gratifying to see all this positive feedback from today. Um, if you think that, you know, if you have lingering questions, things that, that could be changed, um, yeah, don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, yeah, like I said, I'll be here until the end of the hour. So back to the technical stuff. Malcolm asked an excellent, excellent question. So when you're using packages from a function, why does using a namespace function appear in the dependency graph, but using the non-namespace version of the function not appear? So um, we're, ta we're talking about the double colon operator, package colon colon function. So uh, you, could either, you could either call, um, let's say, Okay, so you could call a namespace function like so a namespace call looks something like fire filter when you have that double colon. Um, uh, not namespaced, you need to load the live the, the package first. And then call filter. So in the former case, Drake notices these functions and and tracks them, watches them for changes, puts them in the, in the dependency graph. In the latter case, where these functions are defined in the package environment, not in your own environment, they're not included in the dependency graph. Um, that's that's just a. This gets into into an area of you know a question is you know. Should should Drake track information and watch uh, packages for changes, or should it stay out of that whole business? Um, and if I were to go back and develop Drake from the start all over again, I would say that it should just stay away from the business of of tracking packages. What Drake does try to do, for the most part, is to track objects and functions that exist in your global environment that you define yourself. Uh, either in the global environment or in a special environment, if you if you mess with, uh, or I, sh I shouldn't say, if you take manual control of Drake's environment settings. So, um, if filter were a function defined in your own environment, Drake would track it. But because it's part of dplyr's special package environment, it does not track that unless you do this double colon operator. So Drake, in its static co code analysis, kind of does. It, it kind of tries to do a little bit of both. It, it kind of, so it, 
it doesn't look for, it only looks for functions in your environment for the most part, but it makes an exception for these namespaced calls, these double colon um, calls. And honestly, I kind of regret that now. Um, I, I think that what Drake should be doing is defining a clean break between your custom code and the, the code that's, that's in packages that are external. Um, especially because the RN package has gotten so good. I mean, it's so fast and, and it's, it's so much nicer than Packrat. And it, it provides an excellent way to, to lock down the, the package environment of your project um, and to ensure package reproducibility in a way that, that's, that increases the strength of your project rather than making it more brittle. Um, so um, short answer is, Drake makes a special exception for these double colon namespaced calls and everything else is all the other objects that it tracks have to be defined in your, in your environment. Very long, long story, I know, but it's, it's something I've thought a lot about. Um, I, I don't think a pipeline tool should, should necessarily track uh, packages. I think that Packages should be reasonably permanent for a project and uh, enforced, which is what the RN package does. In fact, I'll, I'll look up RN uh, and post a link to it in the chat because it's such a good package for reproducible research. And I, I'm so glad to hear all this positive feedback coming in. I'm so glad the workshop was useful to you and hands-on um, I'm hoping to. I'm hoping this was was a concrete way to bring this, to bring the things that Drake does to to a really concrete, down to earth level that's 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 easy to follow. And like I said, you can continue where you left off. So after after your, um, if you want to, if you didn't finish everything in the in the in the workshop, or you just want to, um, you might want to retake it, recommend it to others, take it on your own time. So. Learn Drake is a package with all the materials of this workshop. And what you can do is you can uh, write the notebooks with this save notebooks function, which I believe is referenced. Oh, here we go. You can save the notebooks that you just worked through. You can view the slides or launch one of the shiny apps using package functions. You can also, if you have trouble installing TensorFlow, you can actually, um, log into a, a publicly available cloud, RStudio Cloud workspace. Um, the reason I didn't use RStudio Cloud today is because there were, I was expecting a lot of you to, to log in at once. Um, but on your own time, we don't have as many people slamming the, the server at once. And so, um, yeah, this is the recommended uh, way to just go into uh, an RStudio instance and have all the dependencies already installed. Oh, okay. So here, here we go. So there's uh, another another question that, that just came up is is what's up with a target package? Should should I be eyeing it to to update? Um, so um, I kind of hesitate to to talk about this in, in a workshop on on Drake, but let me just say first of all that Drake is is here to stay and. I'm, I'm always going to be developing it. It's always going to be there. Um, I think the feature set of Drake is complete. So um, I'm going to focus on issues that provide maximum concrete value to users. Um, it's been, uh, it's gotten to the point where it's, where it's already very big and very mature. And so there's, there's really no new features or major infrastructure developments that I'm, that I'm planning for. Um, but I will, I will take your requests and, and resolve known bugs and known deficiencies and, and uh, talk about new features. But um, Drake does have limitations. And um, the, I've done all that, I can, all that I think I can to resolve the, the limitations that, are, that were solvable in, in Drake itself. Um, the targets package is... Is, is, is something that's brand new and it's under development, um, but it, it, is, it, it is what I, 
it is a package that um, it's an alternative to Drake, and it it tries to learn from Drake's successes and mistakes during development, and it tries to be the successor that that Drake um, the Drake might have been had we had this experience and and uh, these these learnings when we when we began development. Um, so. Yeah, I, I am excited for targets, and I think it's gonna gonna do a lot of good in this in this pipeline space. Um, and it is a long term successor to Drake, but it's still very early days. Um, it so the targets package, if you look in, in the documentation, it's it it's got its statement. It's got a statement of need um, describing the ways that it's, that, it, that it overcomes some of some of Drake's um, limitations. Um, but it's not going to have everything that Drake has. It's not going to have your your reproducible data recovery, and it's not going to have history. Um, it's it has different opinions of those things. It's more of a, a of a minimal of a minimal tool that tries to make it possible for other for other tools like Git to sort of pick up the slack. Um, but like I said, Drake is always going to be here. Um, I'm going to still be here to answer your questions and. Um, yeah, it's um, there. There is there is a lot of overlap, but um, and it is an awkward time because because targets is really um, it's it's sort of the, the next generation, long long term. Um, but both pipeline toolkits are, are good choices. Um, so if you Drake has been around for a long time, if you really need something that's that's uh, that's been in the community for longer, that's been vetted, validated, and peer-reviewed, and it has a rich feature set that grew organically over time, uh, and includes things like history and data recovery, then, then Drake is, is a great option. Um, if you're willing to live on the bleeding edge, if you want something that's a bit more storage efficient, that has a bit better parallel efficiency, um, then if you want dynamic branching that integrates better with the grouping over, over data frames. Um, if you want to avoid a lot of this metaprogramming that Drake requires sometimes with static branching um, and, and focus more on direct programming without doing specific languages or language objects, then um, target, the targets package might be good to uh, check out. It's, not, it's on my GitHub page. Um, so. There, there is change ahead, but you will never go, you will never uh, go wrong with sticking with Drake. Um, I hope that answers that that question without creating confusion. But since it, since it was asked, I'm 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 giving the full story here and trying to to minimize confusion. There's really, it's it's uh, Yeah, your your existing tools and including this one, all your favorite tools are gonna gonna continue to work and continue to exist. I'm gonna continue to support those uh, the ones that I maintain. I was about to link to the RN package. Let me type this in the chat. Um, RN is a is a package that that um, attempts to create a well it does successfully create a reproducible package environment for your for your project, and it's um, it does this a bit differently than the than the packwrap package, which is its predecessor. RN ensures reproducibility while maintaining a global cache for each user of installed packages to to lighten the not only lighten storage, but light, but but ensure that projects can initialize and um, and update their package environments far far more quickly. And RM is a great companion to Drake because Drake doesn't really dive into these packages, but R that's RM's uh, job, and they work super well together.
the good news for targets is that it's it's a lot easier to for users to for new users to to understand i think and there's there are more guardrails to prevent common pitfalls and and surprises um documentation is a bit more concise because it, we're learning from things that that uh, a lot of the experimentation and, and learn experience from from drake went into targets um and let's see there was something else that i think i wanted to say about it but um yeah it's it's under development right now and um uh it's it's at a state where people can use and, and try it out um and if you if you know drake then you almost know targets because the usages of the packages are very similar and so if you're if you're willing to rerun things from scratch when you start over it's actually quite an easy transition from one package to another um, it's a bit different syntax when you're when you're defining a targets pipeline versus a drake plan but other than that it's the thing the concepts that you learn in these in this workshop especially programming with custom functions um, and you know, keeping your keeping your workflows function oriented rather than script oriented and organizing and defining things in terms of of targets um, that's that's all all that's most of the way there already and except for static branching which is which is which is different um, it's it's quite an easy adjustment actually and yeah like i said all the, the all the 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 concepts that, that were introduced in this in this workshop carry over quite nicely in terms of the mental model
Okay, we're at the top of the hour, and that concludes the tutorial on reproducible computation at scale in R with Drake. Uh, thank you everyone for coming, and this is not really the end because you can reach out with, uh, with questions and use cases. Um, you can take this, this workshop. The materials, like I said, are, on, are online for you to, um, to share and, and finish up later if you, if you choose. Um, thanks to uh, the, the folks at, at USAR and our ladies, um, Alexia and Tess and others for, for making this possible. Thank you for our studio. Thank you to our studio for for providing the infrastructure for the cloud workspaces and apps. I could not have done this without without all of you. And I hope that you that um, you came away with something useful you can apply to your your daily work.